Ben Swan, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, I, I'm not going to give the, the whole speech uh, from earlier, so if you didn't make it for that, then sorry. <laughs> but I, I don't want to do that because I actually want to spend some time taking questions and having more of a kind of a, a dialogue conversation. Um, I think if we can do that, uh, there's probably a little more value to you guys, because um, I'm sure a lot of you have questions about uh, mainstream media and how it operates and, and some of those kinds of things. So um, to be sensitive to that, if I give you the whole spiel, you're going to sit here for 50 minutes and then we're going to do questions. So uh, instead of doing that, um, a couple points I want to make, and I don't have my PowerPoint. Um, it's easier with that because I can, I can show you um, some very specific things. Um, but the main thing that we're pushing right now um, through BenSwan.com, we're, we're about to do a, a makeover of our website, and as we do that, now, now that the, light, the projector's off, I can come over here. So one of the things that we're doing is we're kind of reshaping what we do, and, and we're changing a little bit of our focus and, and our message uh, in how we convey it. And so our, our new uh, phrase that we're using for 2014 is, humanity is greater than politics. And you're going to be hearing that a lot. And, and the reason that we're talking about that is because, as I shared earlier, um, there's a really important issue that's happening in politics right now. And that is, as this, this uh, libertarianism, okay, whether you are a capital L libertarian, or a liberty republican, or a liberty democrat, or wherever you fall, or an independent, right? Um, wherever you fall, an anarchist, you find yourself in a position, look at the anarchist game. <laughs> no one can tell me no. <laughs> you know, as, as we see that happen, um, what we find is that the, the, the discussion, the fight over politics, is always about control, it's about money, it's about influence. And very rarely does it come back to humanity. Uh, and yet, I think what you guys are about, what I'm about, is this effort to say, you know what, the, the, the real struggles that we face in this country. The real struggles that we face on a global level are human struggles. They're not power struggles, they're human struggles. And, and so when people suffer as a result of bad policy, when they, they suffer as a result of a, a lack of freedom, when they suffer because uh, their bodies are being controlled, because their diet is being controlled, because their food supply is being controlled, uh, because their opportunities uh, and entrepreneurship are being controlled, when all those things are being controlled, that's not about politics, it's about humanity. And we have to start changing the way that we talk about politics. Because as long as it remains kind of up here, in, in on this 30,000 foot level of being about which party wins and which party loses. Or, I don't want to vote for the losing candidate, right? Because it's all about this game of, of I don't want to pick the loser, right? Uh, so I don't want to waste a vote on a loser. Um, what we do is we dehumanize what we're actually voting for and what, what we're dealing with. So... What I would really try to push today, especially uh, in the Republican Liberty Caucus, and beat up on Republicans a little bit, uh, because, because politics is not about people. Um, it's about controlling people. And so if we want to push through that, then we have to focus on the humanity. And, and why are things happening the way that they're happening? Who are they affecting? Uh, and how do we fight? How do we fight for little guys like this one right here? Um, improving their life. Um, making sure that they live a more free life than we're living today. And, and it takes a lot of work to do that. It takes a, uh, a huge challenge um, that we have to overcome. So that's the first thing I wanted to share. The other thing I want to share with you, um, before we get into the question part, is something that I'm really trying to push to people all across the country, um, because there is a, such, a, such a distortion of language uh, in our country right now. And so one of the things, I, <laughs> I, I laugh about it because it's, it's almost comical to me, that we have people all the time who will say, the United States is becoming a socialist nation. Have you ever heard anyone say that? Yeah, yeah. And, and if you believe that, then you're about 100 years late, right? The United States is not becoming socialist. The United States is a socialist nation, all right? Now, for the record, okay, when I, when I use the term socialism, I am not using it as a smear. Okay, a lot of people do. In fact, that's really the only way we use it, right? So progressives call themselves progressives because they don't want to be called liberals or socialists anymore because if you call me a socialist, it's, it's a smear. And Republicans or conservatives use the term progressive, all, I mean, um, socialist only as a smear. You're not just a smear. You're, you're about one level from Satan, right, when you're a socialist. So it's, essentially, it's the ruler of hell must be socialist. 
And yet, I was trying to explain to the, the folks today that, um, especially within Republican circles, so they use this term to demonize people all the time. Socialist, socialism. And yet, how many of them realize that the very first Christian movement in the world was a socialist movement? Socialists were the very first Christians. The Book of Acts says that these new believers who were in a group called The Way came together, they took everything that they owned, all their material possessions, all the land that they owned, they sold it off, they brought all the money to the apostles, they gave it to them and said, divide it up equally among us. That's socialism. Now, again, as I said, it's not always a bad thing. That form of socialism is a voluntary form of socialism. There's nothing wrong with that. So when people talk about socialists and, and demonize them that they're this horrible thing, no, 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 socialism's not a bad thing if you choose to be a part of it. I actually know a community of people, they're typically about you know, college age and above, um, about 150 of them who live together in Ohio uh, in what's called a, a community where they have what's called common purse in that community. So everybody works, everybody has a job, but they all put their money into one collective place they have people who are in charge of it and then divvy it up among them when they all receive a stipend from it. Um, <clears throat> what they say is that they don't want to live in excess while the people around them uh, live in need. And so their goal is to live humbly and to encourage as many people to join with them as possible. I don't live in their community, um, but I have a lot of respect for the people who do. Not necessarily even because they do it, but I have respect for them as people. And if that's what they choose to do, if they volunteer to be a part of that system, they have every right to be a part of that system. And we should embrace the fact that they're a part of that system. That is a, a great use of socialism. A poor use of socialism is when I come to you with a gun and say, hey, I think we all need common purse. Okay, So I'm taking what everybody has, and we're going to throw it in a pile, and then I'm going to divvy it up. Okay, And that's what our government does every single day. We, we do that as a, as a form of socialism where you cannot opt out. You're forced into it. And so when you force people to take part in that system, that's the bad use of socialism. That's what, what we use as a slur. That's, but because we only use that, that um, term in a negative way, then we don't fully understand the connotation of what that looks like. Okay? The reason I bring all that up to you, and you say, okay, well, that's fascinating, but it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Well, I, I think it does, because... What's happened in the United States is, because we misuse language so much, we cannot properly articulate what we really struggle with in this country anymore. What is the real problem, political problem, in our nation? We, we, we don't know because of the misuse of language, because we think socialism is coming for us, even though it, we're socialized. Uh, we think that it's going to eventually take over, but, but it's not. In fact, the, the real um, enemy of freedom in this country isn't even a socialist movement. Um, if I had slides, I would advance them and show you that it's not left versus right. And you've heard me say that before if you follow me. It is not left versus right. It is liberty versus tyranny. Right? It is liberty versus tyranny. But if you break down what is tyranny, define tyranny for me. I would define it like this. It is liberty against socialism that is forced upon people, and fascism. Let's talk about fascism. Because there is a real misnomer uh, about what fascism is. And part of that actually is uh, folks who are libertarians, who have seen uh, Freedom to Fascism, right? They've watched the documentary, or they've, they've read the book and they say, oh, I, I know what it is, I know what it is, it's, it's the corporations and the government getting together, right? You guys have seen the, the quote, right? That, that fascism is the, um, the collusion between the state and corporations. And so we have this image that we've developed where we say, okay, the, the corporation is the enemy working in conjunction with the state, and so we're all getting screwed, right? That's how we feel about it. Um, the problem is that quote uh, that is used from Mussolini um, is incorrect in terms of how it's translated. The translation of the word corporation that we, that we see in that movie, um, as it's translated into English, has been mistranslated. So the word um, that would actually have been used is corporativissimo. The word does not mean corporation as in General Mills or General Electric. Okay? Corporativissimo actually means the collective in terms of the population. So what Mussolini talks about in 1932 when he writes 
um, called this, this book called What is Fascism? As he defines it. And by the way, we use Mussolini to define fascism because he created uh, fascism. And, and you need to know that Mussolini created fascism as a political philosophy and movement because he hated socialism. He thought the communists and the socialists had destroyed government and destroyed the system, and this was the better system. This was the evolution of the system. So what Mussolini said was, look, in, in the fascist system, it is where the state and the individual both have power. Okay? But, he says, in the fascist state, the individual has some measure of freedom. Okay? And individual liberty. However, all useless and harmful freedom they must be deprived of. By depriving them of that useless, harmful freedom, you were going to make for a better society. But the other thing he says is that the final arbiter of which freedoms are useless and harmful cannot be the individual. They have to be the state. So Mussolini's belief was that the state was a living, breathing thing. Okay? He believed that the state had rights. The individual has rights. You have the right to own private property, for instance. Did you know that in the fascist state you can own private property? There's no problem with that. But as long as that private property isn't needed by the collective. If the collective needs that private property, they can come and take it from you. That would never happen in the United States, right? <laughs> we wouldn't do that here. Oh, yeah, that's right. We have something called Kilo, right, versus uh, New London, Connecticut, in which our Supreme Court said, actually, yeah, not only under the um, public... Um, um, help me out. It's, uh, well, even a domain, but the specific clause in the Fifth Amendment is the public purpose and public use. It's the public use. Takings clause. Takings clause. That's what I'm looking for. That man just won something. I don't know why. <laughs> but he won something. The takings clause. Thank you. In the Fifth Amendment, uh, essentially refers to public use, and it gives. It does under our Constitution gives government the ability to take certain private land for public use. Now you have to be um, adequately compensated and fairly compensated for that land. We can argue about that. Uh, but it has to be used for public use. The problem with Kelo versus New London, and, and Sandra Day O'Connor wrote the dissenting opinion on it, she essentially says this doesn't, doesn't mean um, that public use would happen. In fact, it's the opposite. What this does is it redefines public use and makes it private use. And you're allowing private entities, corporations, um, and wealthy, influential individuals to take advantage of the system. She says, do not think that the way that this will be enforced will be random, because it will not be. Those who are wealthy, uh, those who have influence, will be able to gain the system. And that's exactly what's been happening uh, since the Supreme Court ruled that. That is fascism. That is fascism. The idea that you may have some rights, but those rights, as our good friend Peter King Congressman from New York likes to say, those rights are not absolute. And that's a great media term that we like to hear, isn't it? Not all rights are absolute. In fact, no right is absolute. So they'll say, you can't just walk into a crowded theater and yell, fire! Like in this little room right here. So if you do that, then that's not protected speech. The Supreme Court said so. As if the Supreme Court is the final arbitrator of everything. As if their, their word is the final ruling on everything. And by the way, media does that too, right? Every time we talk about the Supreme Court, it's like, so shall it be written, so shall it be done. <laughs> Whatever they say, because they are clearly the, the, the final authority on everything. Well, listen, if you believe that the Supreme Court is the final authority on everything, then slavery is perfectly legal. And, and black people can be bought and sold. Because they don't have rights. Because the U.S. Supreme Court said so. But the U.S. Supreme Court was wrong. And so you, when, when, the, when the court is wrong, or the court is corrupt in the decisions that they make, then there has to be uh, a way of, of dealing with that. Um, and there has to be a remedy to it. And you are the remedy. I think there's a song about that. So the whole concept of fascism that I really want to push to people is this idea that what we're living in a time um, that essentially says you don't have any true individual rights. You don't have any. You, they want you to believe um, that your right, for instance, your Second Amendment right, comes down to a need. Why do you need an AR-15 military-style assault weapon? That's the question that keeps being asked over and over and over again in media, doesn't it? The question is asked so often. And the reason they ask the question over and over and over is not because they're looking for the answer. 
because they're trying to plant the question into your mind. Why do I need this? Why do I need this? Why do I need this? Because what they believe, and I think they genuinely believe it, is that you don't need it, and if you don't need something, and it doesn't serve the purpose of the greater good for you to have it, then it can be taken away from you. You don't have a right to something that may violate the greater good concept. But think about what the founders and framers designed for us. The founders and framers designed a system that was not built upon greater good, was it? No. We hold these shoes to be self-evident that all men are created equal, right? And they have what? Certain unalienable rights that were what? Endowed by who? Their creator. Now, if you say, well, I don't believe in a creator, fine, then they came from fate. They came from nature. They just happened upon you. But either way, they belong to you. Because the word endowed, wherever they came from, means that those rights were not granted by the Constitution. They were not written into the Constitution and therefore became yours. The Constitution merely pointed out rights that you were already endowed with. That's important. Because go to the Bill of Rights and look at what the founders and framers were trying to point out. Not trying to give you. They weren't giving you anything. They were pointing out rights that already belong to you. They're already yours. In a fascist state, you will be told over and over that you have no right that supersedes the greater good. If you have any right, whether it's speech, whether it's religion, whether it's uh, the, the, the right to a firearm, or the, the right to arm yourself, the right to due process, none of that belongs to you if the greater good is at risk. The secret to fascism is that the greater good is always at risk, according to the people who enforce the law. And yet the greater good is never at risk. But they use that claim. Great example of it. Um, so the, when the incandescent light bulbs were being essentially forced off of store shelves, right? You can't buy an incandescent light bulb. You hate the mother of the universe. Where they got those from? Stockpiling them in the basement. Got all kinds of incandescent light bulbs in here. So when the incandescent light bulbs uh, were, were, you know, being forced off of shelves and CFLs were coming in and, and essentially being mandated uh, to consumers, you know, they had already been in existence for about 30 years. But people didn't buy them. It wasn't that CFL suddenly showed up one week and then we said, this is this great new technology, Eureka, now it's time to use it. They'd been around for a long time, but people didn't like the light they emitted, they're more expensive, and they just didn't take off with consumers. And so government decided that you needed to purchase them. And Energy Secretary Stephen Chu at the time said, we are taking away a choice from the consumer that they continually make that's costing them money. That was a justification for it. You have to justify taking this away from you because you are just not willing to stop wasting your money on those incandescent light bulbs. That's the greater good concept. Let's take they're care really, of it. They're really not going away. There's just a new version of them that's a little bit more efficient. They're not actually getting rid of the incandescent light bulb. Not getting just, rid of it all? No, just the old incandescent light bulb. They have a new one that's a little bit more efficient. And filled with mercury also. No, no, it's a regular incandescent light bulb. We'll, we'll, we'll get those. Is that where these are? I don't know what those are. I went and bought some. <laughs> don't break any kids. It's got mercury. <laughs> the CFLs have mercury. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the CFLs are horrible. Poisoning, poisoning us. But it's yeah. propaganda. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're required to, we are required to buy CFLs that have mercury in them. I mean, if you're talking about the greater good concept, it doesn't make any sense to say the greater good is buy this one filled with poison. But and don't break it. It's propaganda. Now nobody is going to go into the store looking for incandescents. They're just going to assume that they can only buy the mercury when the incandescents are still there. And of course, the, where are the, incandes are the CFLs made? They're all made in China. Yeah. <laughs> because, because GE, who thought they were about to bring in all this money by, by producing CFLs, found out they could not produce them cheaper than China. So we outsource all those jobs to China and, and then say, as the Chinese send us poison, don't break the bowl. Anyways, uh, the, the point, guys... Um, is I think we just have to really work through the concept of what it looks like um, to be cautious about language. And, and, and as we do, begin to educate people. What we are not, we're not moving to socialism. We're there. And, and where we're headed from here is deeper into uh, the fascist state that takes away your rights. I think that if you can articulate those things, I think if you can share with people some of those concepts, you have the ability to really bring people into this movement. I think you have the, the ability to find, especially in this part of the country, um, Tea Party mentality folks, um, the folks who are evangelicals, um, who really do believe in, they believe in, 
individual rights until they don't believe in them. So what we have to do is we have to educate them. We have to, to gently work with people to say, here's what your rights look like, and here's how we preserve your rights. And then and the final thing I tell you before we do questions um, is, I really, I really want to stress this to you, um, is we have to learn how to build relationships and community uh, in this movement. Because if we want to believe that, that we're absolutely right, okay, I'm absolutely right in my particular view of things, and, and I don't like the way these Tea Party people think, or I don't like the way that these, and I'm using the terms, and I'm not using them as smears, but some people do. I don't like the way these conspiracy people think. Uh, I don't like the way that these capital L libertarians think. I don't like the way that these anti-war Democrats, whatever we're doing, when we start pushing each other away, you know what ends up happening? Is you're standing here nice and self-righteous, and you lose. And that's what's been happening for a long, long time in this country. Fight about all these things that we're not 100% on the same page with. One thing that I absolutely love, we were having a conversation in the back a few minutes ago, one thing I love about this, this liberty movement is that in this movement, you have a whole lot of misfits. And I love that. Because I know, really, and, I, and I'm not saying it as an insult. I, when I say misfits, I mean people that other parties and other political movements have no interest in. You don't fit uh, their exact mold. You don't walk in lockstep with what they say. And so they say, well, listen, if, if you're not going to be exactly with us on everything, then we don't want any part of you. So get ready. We don't need you anyways. And they push you aside. Every great human movement in history <laughs> began with the disenfranchised, the people on the edges, the people on the fringes who have been pushed away. Those are the people that begin great movements. And when we can come together and begin to win people over to the concept of, I want to have freedom, and I want you to have freedom. And I may not agree with how you use yours, but I believe so much in mine, and I believe so much in, in freedom for my children, that I will fight and defend your freedom, even if I don't like how you use it. Even if I don't agree with how you use it. And that's a very tough concept in a fascist nation. It's very tough. Because fascism tells us the very opposite must be true. Evangelicals believe the very opposite must be true. And I have a real heart for evangelicals. I really do. I think that they have a, a great opportunity to be a huge part of this movement. But they're, they've been led astray on a lot of issues. And, and more than anything else, they've been told over and over and over again, we must legislate and control and force people to think how we think. And if they don't, got no room for them. They're watching their own liberties, they're watching their own religious freedom being taken away from them. And, and they don't even see it, because they're so busy worrying about taking somebody else's. So we got to work through that, we got we to push through that. Uh, Marcus Aurelius once said, he said, accept the things to which fate binds you. And love the people with whom fate brings you together. But when you do so, do so with all your heart. You don't get to choose him. Someone just Mark Rosalia's died. Is that what you said? No. <laughs> he got killed. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's the part of the story we didn't want to tell you. Uh, listen, the, the the reality is that we didn't get to choose this moment when we talk about liberty. You know, every generation in world history, at some point or another, um, faces the same problems. We all do. You know, the, the issues of tyranny are not new. They were not invented uh, by modern people. Tyranny has existed so long as humankind has, has existed. It's a human problem. Since, the, since there were humans on the earth, there has been the desire for one person to rule another. Since there have been humans on the earth, there has been a desire for the strong to rule over the weak, or for the few to rule over the many. It's happened all throughout human history. And throughout human history, every once in a while, there comes a generation that pushes back against that and says, we believe that we don't need to be ruled, that we should be free. Now what's been incredible throughout this, this thing of human history is that very rarely, very rarely, have, has there been a collective movement that has allowed the birth of a nation based in that concept. When the founders and framers were, were dreaming up this thing called the Declaration, when they were dreaming up the Bill of Rights, do you really think that they suddenly 
kind of pontificated and came up with all this stuff on their own? Do you think this, this idea of freedom came directly from them? No. In fact, the concepts of freedom go back to the Magna Carta and before. People for hundreds of years, people for thousands of years, who had thought of what it would be to live as a free people. And it was passed out. What's that? Because the Native Americans were doing it. And they were doing it. And they were fine. They were, you have people who, have, who have, have, have lived through this, and, and again, you have cultures of people who have been free, and the cultures who were enslaved. And we have cycles of it. But here's what happens. When we finally get to this thing called um, the United States of America, we have an opportunity to create and craft laws that now protect rights that we've already been endowed with. And whoever said Native Americans were not recipients of that, were they? Not very well. No, not very well. And, and African Americans were not. And women were not. The, the execution of their idea was very imperfect. It was poorly executed on many levels. But over time, it's gotten better. So now it's our turn. I think that we've been watching for the last 100 years, when we talked about socialism, for the last 100 years, socialism has come along. And now it's our time. We've watched the creeping fascism, but now it's our time. This is our opportunity today, I believe, to be a generation that pushes back and says, nope, we're not going to do it. Because we learn from the past. And we look at what, what the past was, and we look at what was imperfect about it, and we look at the ideals that were perfect, and we move forward with it. I am, I am excited to be with you tonight. I'm excited that, that each one of you is a part of that. So accept this moment. Accept that you didn't choose to be here. Accept that you didn't select that this would be the time of your birth or the country in which you were born. Or that the circumstances of your life have led you to this awakening. Accept the things to which fate binds you. Look around this room and realize that not everyone here is going to be your favorite person. Some of them you might not like at all. And that's okay. We don't need to pretend to like each other. But you love those with whom fate brings you together. And love means respecting other people and treating them with dignity and with kindness and do so with all your heart. That's what I wanted to share with you guys tonight.